Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining. Uh, so this is a fourth edition of uh, Conversations uh, with Green Changemakers in Japan. So um, as you know, if you've been there already, the goal is really to bring along passionate individuals to talk about various topics around ecology and well-being. So today we have the chance to welcome uh, Ian Shimizu. Uh, he's, uh, Hi. Hi. <laughs> he's the co-founder of uh, Wimori. Uh, so Wimori is a recently launched uh, uh, app that makes protecting and restoring forests fun, easy, and accessible for all. So uh, Ian will uh, tell us a bit more about his story and how our consumption are, is actually affecting uh, the deforestation, among other things. So we will cover many, many different topics. First of all, uh, something a bit more personal. Uh, can you tell us a bit more when and how you became aware of the issue with uh, climate change and how you started your personal journey on your ecological transition? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's a pretty difficult question to answer. Um, I think first when I ever heard about climate change must have been a long time ago when I was maybe in elementary school or middle school. Um, but for a long period of my life, I didn't necessarily recognize it as something that I had to take action for or take leadership in uh, addressing. Um, but when I was in university, I learned about the fundamental uh, disagreement uh, that we as a civilization continue to carry and this is that we are aiming to grow or we are hoping to achieve progress uh, while we continuously consume more environmental resources natural resources and this is a fundamental flaw in the system whereas we're achieving uh, or trying to achieve unlimited growth off of a limited resource base, which is impossible. And this is the reason why we consider our society as being uh, not sustainable today. And when I came to this realization, it was more kind of a discovery in a sense that you, know, you, you live until one day not thinking about this, not knowing about this. And then one day it suddenly hits you that, oh my God, it's not sustainable this will not continue forever and that thought really 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 provoked me in many different ways um what does it mean that something is not sustainable if we don't live in a sustainable world what is everything surrounding me today representing as somebody who loves nature what does it mean to live within a system that's not protecting it but destroying it. All these questions flooded to me in over the course of a week or a couple of months, and it was really overwhelming. Um, and so it wasn't really, I started with climate change, but uh, I was awoken to the fact that we live in a fundamentally flawed system and that something has to be done to address this system. And one of the manifestations of this flawed system is climate change which then in turn perpetuates negative feedback cycles that make living and surviving much harder on this planet where already it's not necessarily easy for most of the people living here and i realized that the climate changing was one of the accelerators of all other issues if the climate started changing it would create conditions for all other issues to get worse so it was one of the founding you know it's a, it's a because well how can i explain this the the climate is a is a foundational aspect or element or of the environment in which we live so if that changes everything else within it has to change and so it's, it's considered to be a risk multiplier and all these things. But I came to the realization that in order to address anything, we need to address climate change. And since it's a manifestation of the flawed system, if we can solve climate change, then we're one step, we're taking one step forward in solving all sorts of other issues, everything from poverty to, 
to issues around food to um, even marine resources um, to to uh, also solving the fundamental disagreement in our system. So climate change was kind of my way into taking action because yeah, it connects to everything else. Mm, makes sense. And so what? So you you mentioned that it's actually during your studies that you really had this uh, connection between uh, climate change and the way we consume. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of uh, studies did you do, and you know what's your background actually? Yeah. So um, I studied sociology when I was in university. I did a lot of different things. I did. Uh, I did. Um, first, I wanted to be a musician. <laughs> And then I went into more business and then I just started diving into environment. But that also has to, con you know, it also connects with the fact that I always loved nature as a kid growing up. I always loved it. I always loved going to the mountains, loved going to the ocean, loved checking, uh, hanging out in the jungle like our friend Keisuke Robo Japan here uh, joining us. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I always loved nature and sociology uh of all the different majors that i was kind of dabbling with in university seemed the most real it felt like it was the most real thing um because it wasn't overly theoretical it was very much uh the classes that i was taking was uh was centered around critiquing phenomena that exist today within society for example issues of racism or um yeah like issues of class issues of discrimination um, and so it felt like the most real thing that I could do, whereas business was an entrepreneurship was often kind of, it felt fluffy and not really grounded in reality. So sociology I was suddenly very much drawn to. And then I started thinking about these environmental things and my encounter or the discovery of that happened through a book called A Green New History of the World. Um, it's uh, a book about environmental history. It, goes back thousands of years, um, talks about how humans have been interacting with nature and how we have come to where we are today. And it also talks about the rise and collapse of past civilizations. And you see that in most cases, environmental issues were at least uh, a factor in their uh, eventual collapse. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, I was studying environment from the perspective of history and sociology. Makes sense. Yeah, it's something that's that's a good. And so you said like you started to want to act mm -hmm. to address this uh, climate change uh, issue. How mm -hmm. did that translate? You know, in your you know activism and your involvement, or even in your day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first thing that happened to me was um, I got really depressed um, when I first learned the scale of the environmental crisis and that we were basically flawed from the very foundations of the system. Um, I felt powerless, I felt small, I felt tiny, I felt betrayed, um, I felt overwhelmed, I didn't know what to do, and it didn't feel like anything I did would really change anything. I felt completely out of place, uh, because most of my friends didn't necessarily care, most of the faculty don't care, um, and most of the world is structured as if the world is sustainable. They don't really question the underlying contradictions of our system. They continue reaping the benefits of how the system is structured today. So as somebody, as an individual that one day in a classroom woke up thinking, oh my God, the world is not sustainable. It was as if I had completely lost my footing uh, and I fell and I felt very deep. I felt in, 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 in falling, I felt very powerless and I got very depressed, unsure what I can do. Um, but I learned as I, as I grappled with my depression that it was through small successes and through acting in whatever way that I could uh, that made me feel better. Um, and this is something that a lot of people in this field talk about, that in order to uh, combat this sense of powerlessness, uh, action is the most effective. And I slowly came to realize that, but it wasn't at all um, a simple story of 
ah, I realized the issue one day and the next day I started taking action and here I am today. It was, I discovered the issue, grappled with it, fell into a depression, um, really wondered what I could do about it. And over time, slowly realized that, oh, it feels better to do something than to not. Oh, it feels really good to be able to meet people who know and feel and think the same things than to stay in my house and feel miserable. Um, so it was through these like, small successes that I had accumulate and these new connections that I would create in, through those small actions um, that made me realize that, okay, so this is the way forward. Um, and now I am you know, happy to say that I am not no longer suffering from the depression that I was before. Um, but yeah, so it was a long journey until I arrived at action. But once you come to the realization and then you try to integrate what you've realized into your life, uh, it should definitely change the way you consume. And for me, it really changed everything. It changed my outlook of how I wanted to live, uh, what work I wanted to do, who I wanted to be around, what I wanted to buy, mostly what I didn't want to buy, um, how I wanted to, what I wanted to read, what I wanted to watch, uh, what I wanted to drink, what I wanted to apply on my body, you know, everything, <laughs> literally, it changed literally everything. Yeah, that's nice. Um, and so maybe can you tell us a bit more how you came about starting uh, 350.org because I mm -hmm. think that probably came from that um, journey I guess yeah yeah so 350 was something I started like third or fourth year in university I'm not really clear when because I was taking a lot of gap years um, I also failed a lot of classes so I had to repeat a few years so I'm not really sure which year it was, um, but when I was doing environmental sociology in university, I started looking into environmental issues around Japan, and that brought me into the space of activism, um, and that was around 2013, 2014, and 2015 was the year of the Paris Climate Agreement, and that was when I started working with 350. Um, through my activism, I had connected with people who were uh, in the Japanese nonprofit sector, um, environmental nonprofit sector, and I was introduced to somebody who had just started the 350 Japan office. And 350 was a really, really interesting organization uh, because it was the fastest growing nonprofit at the time, environmental nonprofit at the time. It was employing this uh, new method called divestment in addressing climate change. It was uh, mobilizing the youth. And it was taking also, well, this connects with divestment, but it was um, using um, the power of the people in order to affect change, which was always a part of nonprofit work, uh, but not as um, intensely or centered as it was for 350. And I found it really, really exciting and interesting if I could become a member of that or, or go through the unique process of founding the Japan office. Um, I thought it would be a really fulfilling role to play as well as a really um, rich uh, journey in terms of learning. So yeah, that was third year or fourth year university that I, instead of going to school, I just started to full time dedicate my time to 350, which then also meant that I still didn't graduate. Um, so it took me even more years to graduate after that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that was 350. Makes sense. And you were just mentioning the methodology they are using, uh, the divestment uh -huh. uh, method. Can you tell us a bit more about that, actually? Yes, absolutely. Divestment is the opposite of investment. So maybe some of you in the audience today invest your money. Divestment is the opposite. It's the act of pulling that money out. Um, and divestment, uh, I think, applies to all sorts of different scales. At the smallest scale, if you learn that uh, Oreos were contributing to the cutting down of rainforests in Borneo, maybe you would stop eating Oreos. Uh, you can say then that you have divested from Oreos because you've decided not to buy that anymore. Um, in the financial sector, divestment is when you pull investments out of a company or out of a project. And particularly in the case of climate change, uh, divestment is pulling money out of um, fossil fuel energy. So if you're a big bank or if you're a an investor with a lot of money, or if you're an asset manager with a lot of money, and you have a part of your money invested into shares of uh, fossil fuel companies, divesting would be the act of 
selling those shares, getting rid of those, uh, pulling your money out of that, getting rid of the shares uh, so as to cut your ties with those companies which are making money um, through essentially the pollution of our atmosphere. Makes sense. Um, to go back a little bit about uh, you know, um, your activism, so what does being an activist mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've wondered that a lot because um, I've never really considered myself an activist. Um, I wasn't even the one to start calling myself an activist. I was, I was named activist for like articles that were written about me in the past. So it was not that, you know, I was like declaration of Ian's activist starts on April 28th or whatever. Like it was never like that. It just uh, kind of became, it was like a natural part of the process. Um, so I, I, you know, there were times in my past when I struggled with that, like what, what does it even mean to be an activist? Um, but uh, for me, it really means to be questioning um, and constantly searching for ways to live uh, in harmony with the environment. Essentially, it, it is the pursuit of finding a way to make that possible. Uh, so for me, that's what it means. Makes sense. Uh, actually, that's uh, an interesting question that came from the chat that's uh, mm -hmm. similar to what I had uh, for you as well, which is sometimes it's uh, quite difficult to raise awareness about these very serious issues. Mm -hmm. uh, some people tend maybe to shut off or you know, when it becomes too overwhelming or what are your ways of uh, dealing with that and maybe your strategies uh -huh. to engage? Yeah, so I think it really, really depends on where you're at, uh, first and foremost. Um, I think one of the most important things to think about is how are you feeling about that thing that you want to convey to the people around you? And when I was in university, my primary emotion was anger. I was really pissed off. I was really angry that... For some reason, I had been born into a system that was designed to, you know, for not for sustainability and that we have climate change, that we have biodiversity loss. And of course, you know, I, I, that's just focusing on the negatives. We have all sorts of other things like life and technology and brilliant things as well. Um, but I was feeling really angry that people had been pursuing progress all the while ignoring the deeper, larger, more fundamental issue of the unsustainable culture which we have created. And I, when I was approaching this from anger, I felt very entitled. I felt that I'm right and you're wrong. And whenever you're trying to convince somebody from that standpoint, it usually fails because you're speaking from the position of entitlement. You're not extending your understanding of how that person is feeling or how that person is where they are. Um, and I think because I wasn't really sure how to approach this issue, I was sticking my middle finger up at everything that came to me, if that makes sense. So everybody around me that wasn't living as an activist would be, I was, you know, my approach was, oh, you're wrong. But, um, but the middle finger should always be pointed at the system not the individual. I think that's a very important thing uh, to keep in mind, that it's not the person in front of you that you have to change necessarily. If you could convince that person, awesome. But uh, the most important thing is that we have to affect the system. Um, so pointing the middle finger at everybody around you if they're not in alignment with your ideals is probably not going to work, especially if that's coming from the, the a place of, of uh, entitlement and anger. Um, without having the understanding or recognition of why that person is where they are right now. Um, and I don't think there's any kind of golden rule of thumb to convince people around you, but I think at the end of the day, like everything comes down to an opinion. No matter, no matter what you're talking about, it comes down to an opinion. So sure, for, so for example, uh, to, to, to help you maybe understand this, the UN says we have to keep climate change under 1.5 degrees. And this is a globally agreed goal. And that should be that way. I believe it 
should be. I believe we should all be doing everything we can um, to keeping climate change under 1.5 degrees. But that's also because I believe that um, people who live in low-lying island nations, for example, in the South Pacific or in places like Bangladesh should not be subject to uh, climate injustice and suffer the effects of sea level rise. But ultimately, there are people who really honestly don't care about that. Like that just simply do not think that that is something that they should care about. And so on what basis would you convince that person when you cannot agree on such a fundamental point? Uh, I think for me, it comes down to that everything that you express uh, is, is, you know, you can ultimately only express it as your opinion. So I make that very clear that my opinion on this matter is that I think we should keep climate change under 1.5 degrees um, and really try to have my own words and have my own thinking around why I stand um, on, the, uh, on, on either the right side or the left side of a certain line and not kind of, and, and not use the, 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 the na a narrative that's been spun elsewhere. For example, I don't, I would not like to see myself engaging in a conversation saying, I think we should keep, or, or we should keep one, a climate change under 1.5 degrees because the UN said so. I feel that that is not so helpful. Um, so one of the things that I do is that I, I try to have an opinion uh, or, or I try to bring it back to my own thinking and my own opinion. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's helpful, but, uh, but, yeah, uh, but, but yeah, I think it's important to recognize that everything is an opinion, uh, mm -hmm. fundamentally, and that you're not right, necessarily. I think maybe that's the most important thing, is that you're, you're you, you, yeah, that mm, I don't really approach it anymore as if I am the golden standard, as, as if I'm right. Um, now I would like to talk a little bit more uh, uh, with you about your latest project, uh, which is tackling uh, deforestation. Mm -hmm. So, um, first of all, like, can you tell us a little bit more, you know, what is actually happening globally with uh, deforestation and what are the different causes of that? Right. So the project that I'm doing right now is um, called We Mori. And it, um, the goal is to mobilize people from around the world to fund um, protection and restoration projects around the world. So we have the issues of climate change and biodiversity loss. And protecting and restoring forests is one of the most powerful ways to address these two issues at once. Um, that's not to mention that forests also clean our waters, regulate weather, uh, provide um, all sorts of other merits to human society, including medicine. Um, in fact, 90% uh, of our conditions can be uh, cured through um, medicines that are derived from rainforests. Crazy. Um, so protecting and restoring forests is really important for us in general, all of us, every single one of us, um, in every way imaginable. So what this app is trying to do is to make, uh, make it possible for all of us to donate to pr projects around the world that protect forests and restore forests. Um, yeah, um, and try to make it really, really easy. And when I look back at my career as an activist, uh, I realized that I've been exploring, how can we bring people who don't care to care? And those people that do care, how can we bring them to action? And I think there's two really important things in convincing people from going from inaction to action. And I think that's uh, convenience, lowering the hurdle, and transparency, making it very clear uh, what impact they're having. Um, so that's really important in the WeMori app. We want to make it literally like, you know, like you can just ta literally just, if you have a finger, you can take action. <laughs> and um, we will present the information um, or we will show what we have been able to accomplish through your donations in the app. So you can access it anytime and see it. And if we accomplish that, nobody any longer has an, has an excuse <laughs> to not take action because it's just that easy. Makes sense. And so you're, you're taking um, deforestation and like trying to reforest and plant mm -hmm. trees. 
Um, why do we see deforestation happening actually? And what's going on actually around that? Yeah, so for a lot of reasons, and it depends on which part of the world that you're talking about, um, most of it comes from conversion to agricultural lands. So deforestation happens because forests are being converted to land for agriculture. And in the Amazon, 80 to 90% of that is directly connected to the meat industry. So if you're a carnivore, uh, most likely you are contributing to the deforestation of the Amazon. Um, or if you've eaten, if, if you only eat, well, no, 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 that's not even true. Yeah, if you're a carnivore, I would say 99% you are contributing to the deforestation of the Amazon, either through the direct consumption of meat that was grown there or through the consumption of meat that has eaten the soy or corn or other feed that is given to the cows, which then you eat, or the pork or the chicken. Um, so if you're a carnivore, most likely you're contributing to deforestation in the Amazon. Um, in Southeast Asia, it's slightly different. Um, it's if you eat chips, if you eat fried chips, if you like your consomme panchi, um, you're most likely contributing to um, the conversion of rainforest to palm oil fields. Um, yeah, so it really depends. If you're, uh, it's a little more complicated in Congo um, and in other areas of Africa. Um, because in some cases it's to get charcoal wood, um, in some cases it's for pineapples, in some cases it's for other types of agriculture um, that may not be con connected to our consumption, but I'm sure it is. It's just that it's much harder to get data uh, in those areas. Um, but yeah, so, so it's, it's connected to our consumption in many ways as well. Mm. It's true, and even like palm oil, you can find it everywhere. Like even in uh, like uh, body care products, it's like literally everywhere. Yeah, shampoo, um, in in cream, in it's so it's in the Oreo that I spoke about earlier. It's in <laughs> chips. It's in all sorts of things, like yes. all sorts of things. Yeah, that's true. And then of course there's timber, um, which yeah, which which Japan is actually. Uh, pretty bad um, a lot of our the timber that we use for consumption comes from rainforest in Borneo wow, really? mm. yeah like um I live not so far from the uh, the Olympic Stadium mm -hmm. and the Olympic Stadium the stadium itself uses Japanese wood um, but in the process of building that stadium uh, there's they call it the invisible wood of construction because um, a lot of wood is used in the process of construction. So when they put in the concrete to, for example, you know, make a block of concrete, they create the edges with these wood slabs. And a lot of those wood slabs in, that we use in Japan comes from Borneo. So that's a source of deforestation, but uh, it's not used in the final product. So that's why um, the, 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 the Olympic Stadium would say, 100% Japanese wood, but not if you consider the entire process. Mm -hmm. And at one point, there was a petition, I think, that came out of Germany or Sweden that got tens of thousands of um, signatures uh, um, to pressure uh, the Japanese government to stop the use of um, Borneo rainforest wood for the construction processes of, uh, of, of the Olympic Stadium as well as uh, other parts of the construction mm, interesting it's, it's true that sometimes there's a lack of like you were saying transparency on the whole process of things like maybe we will be celebrating the end product when actually the afterlife or like the raw materials or some elements that have been used are actually quite uh, quite bad so. Mm -hmm. um so can you tell us a bit more like the impact this uh, deforestation apart from you know obviously the, the impact on the environment it creates with the, the change in temperatures and, and stuff. But what's the impact on local populations, mm -hmm. uh, local e ecosystems, and for, for us with regards to climate change, actually? Yeah, so there's a lot. Um, for example, um, one of the, um, okay, I'll, 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 um, I'll mention two things. One, and, and there's a lot more. 
um, one has to do with fish and the other has to do with uh, bees. So one of the things that forests do is that it locks soil. So the roots um, lock soil where it is. And by locking the soil, um, it prevents erosion. So um, when water passes over uh, the forest because the soil is being locked into the land, it um, goes through the soil without the soil being run off, running off with the water. That's when there's a diverse, diverse forest like a rainforest. And what that allows is for clean water to pass through the soil down to the roots and then go into the river in the local streams in a very clean way. Um, so it goes in in a filtered state. Um, whereas if you well, pulled out those trees and it rains on top of that land, then there's nothing to hold the soil in place. So the water um, and the soil runs into the water, um, into the stream, and it pollutes the water. It, it, uh, it contaminates it. You know, this is not the same pollution of like chemicals going in the water, but for the life that's living in the water, it's pollution nonetheless, because um, by the soil coming in, uh, the, f the, the, the marine uh, animals in the water suffocate. They can't breathe anymore. Um, so they say deforestation has a huge impact on freshwater fishing. Um, and there's a lot of people around the world who rely on freshwater fishing, uh, particularly in rivers like the Amazon, where it carries a lot of water and extends for thousands of kilometers. Um, this, the, the populations for that, those thousands of kilometers they rely on that fish, which would be much harder to get if there's deforestation. Um, the other thing is bees. Um, the forests uh, harbor a lot of life. Uh, amongst them are bees, which are completely necessary to um, pollinate plants, pollinate crops. And a lot of the crops that are grown in uh, the, as, uh, the forest as well as outside of the forest rely on these pollinators to. Um, continue uh, farming essentially. Um, so by cutting down forests, uh, you are you are lessening the habitat for the bees to exist in, which then in turn uh, affects local agriculture or limits the kind of agriculture that you can do, depending on your distance from the forest or or how how much further the forest has become from where you are. Um, so those are two examples that, you know, on the more micro scale that has an impact on the people who live directly around the forests. And of course, that's not to mention that there are people who live in the forests, um, who live uh, based on subsistence by uh, taking things from the forest in a, in a sustainable way. Um, these tend to be indigenous populations that are spread across the world. Um, and if you deforest, you're essentially ridding them of their livelihood. So that's another thing. Mm. And do you think people are aware of this issue in, in Japan? Um, it's, it's not so black and white. I'm sure there are people who are aware, um, others that are completely unaware. Um, but I think there are a lot of people who are unaware that um, it would be really important work to make them more aware. Mm. Uh, so now I'd like to talk to you a bit more about the, the projects uh, you were telling us about. Mm -hmm. um, so um, when did you start the, the project actually and how did you have uh, this idea? Yeah, so I've been doing environmental activism for a while. Um, and at first it was really about movement building. But I realized that in order to build a movement, you need people who care about the issue. And I felt in Japan, there were not enough people who cared about the issue. So I moved to awareness raising. Um, and I did awareness raising, like speaking on the radio, speaking in front of people, speaking in front of uh, kids for about two years. Um, and then towards the end of those two years, I was feeling a number of things. One is that um, we need something that's more immediate because awareness raising is really a long-term uh, uh, I wouldn't like to call it battle, but uh, you, it, it takes a lot of time to convert people or to spread the message to more people, especially when you're one person with two legs and only one mouth. Um, there's only so much you can do. Um, so I wanted something that has a more immediate and tangible impact than awareness raising. Um, 
I also wanted to do something that brought me closer to nature because I started all this or yeah, I started all this because I love nature. And yet as, as f the more I did environmental activism, I felt that I was being taken further away from nature. So for example, to give an example, um, I would be speaking on radio on the 37th floor of Rupongi Hills to 300,000 people over a microphone to talk about environmental issues that I'm like, I'm the furthest thing from a tree right now. <laughs> you know? And I was feeling this kind of, um, this contradiction in my life as an environmentalist and, and me as an individual and what I loved. Um, and there's a third thing that I forgot for now. So I'm just going to stick for these two things. And so in, in, by doing We Mori, it brings me closer to exploring more about nature. It, it allows me to dive deeper into understanding the importance of forests, um, what they've meant in our evolution, what they mean for our future. These very interesting topics to me, I have the opportunity to explore more deeply. Um, and I think they're really, really important things to explore. Um, not just for my sake, not just for the forest sake, but for much wider um, uh, for reasons. Um, and protecting and restoring forests is something that everybody can participate in. Yeah, I remember that's the third thing is that um, I wanted to provide something that was actionable and protecting and restoring forests is something that has an immediate impact because if you put your money or if we engage towards protecting and restoring forests now, um, the impact will happen like now um, or tomorrow. The moment that person puts that tree in the ground, or the moment those people put those forests under protection, that impact has been done. Uh, which, so it's immediate and it's tangible. And uh, yeah, going back to the point that it's actionable through WeMori, we can provide a platform for people to participate in that. Um, so those are really important things in my transition from raising awareness to uh, doing WeMori. Um, and of course, there's all sorts of other reasons as well. For example, when I was doing movement building and divestment at 350, uh, I felt that, it, the, the, that what we were doing was such a high hurdle engagement that it really required people to really either care or really be um, engaged in the conversation in order to come to the point where they're willing to you know, take on these large institutions and tell them to divest. Whereas an app in your hands can really be a segue into people who have been inactive to becoming active. Um, and that could perhaps act as a gateway into further action or, or deepening their interest in the topic. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to provide an easy way to take action, which would provide a, a, a gate into welcoming more people onto this side of the line. Um, I think it makes sense. And especially maybe uh, with my perspective coming from a, a foreigner, like I feel like activism, especially in Japan, is very challenges to, challenging, sorry, getting people to go out and maybe do a demonstration is very, very difficult. While, like you said, just, you know, acting on, on your phone and getting informed is much, much easier, I feel. Absolutely. Like in Japan, there has to be well, it really depends on the topic, doesn't it? Because after 3.11, we had hundreds of thousands of people marching the streets to, you know, calling for the, the pause of all nuclear power. So it's not necessarily that Japanese people are just dormant and don't like marching. They do, but they require extremely high input in order for there to be the output of, of mass mobilization. And at the moment in, in climate change, that input doesn't exist, at least in the eye of uh, the Japanese public, um, which, you know, has to do with a lot of things like the media and education as well. Um, yeah, so I, I agree with the point that it's difficult to mobilize people, particularly with climate change. Um, but even when you look at countries like Europe, even when you look at countries like America, um, UK has been conservative politics for 10 years. Uh, US is run by the Republican Party. Um, we here might think that climate change is an issue. We here might be the first ones to take to the streets if, if there's an opportunity to raise our voice against climate change, but we are still such a minority. We are still much smaller than the, the 
the, the other side. I, I don't really want to antagonize them. That's not my intention. But uh, we are still the minority. So even today, providing a way uh, for people who um, haven't taken action to take action um, is important, whether that's in Japan or overseas. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, going back to your um, uh, Kickstarter campaign, because you're oh, yeah. currently doing a Kickstarter campaign. So guys, don't hesitate to check uh, the link uh, in the chat box. Uh, there's an element uh, of it which I really liked, which is mm -hmm. the, the fact that the campaign in itself is uh, regenerative. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us about this uh, aspect of it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the campaign is regenerative in the sense that, so we're on Kickstarter right now. It's been 20 days. We have 10 days left. Um, please check it out. Um, you can join by pledging one tree for nine dollars or a thousand yen so it's really easy for anybody to join um, and that's why it's regenerative because um, if you join the campaign any reward that you pick we plant at least one tree so you're contributing to us developing the app and you're also contributing to actually reforesting um, a forest either in borneo or kenya so um, yeah when we did the campaign we didn't want it to just be like help us fund our app we wanted to make it um something that was true to us so the regeneration aspect was really important so we designed it or structured it in a way that whichever tier you pick whichever reward you pick um we plant at least one tree makes sense and something i like about uh, your, your project and that you mentioned which is the transparency element um, and I'd like maybe for you to share a bit more, you know, the criteria you, you mm -hmm. use to select the reforestation project to support, because we know that so, not all the reforestation projects can be truly beneficial if they're not done in the right way. Yeah, so there's a lot of reforestation projects that um, create tree plantations um, that plant monocultures, you know, like one tree, one tree species, and then like in a straight line. And that's, that could do more damage than good. So we really want to be uh, sure that we're not participating in those campaigns. Um, right now, we're working with an organization called World Land Trust, which has 25 years of experience in protecting and restoring forests around the world. And so together with them, we select our projects. And right now we have selected a project in Kenya and Borneo, and I'll share the project in Borneo a little bit. So this one is a, a project to create a corridor between two um, wildlife sanctuaries. And these wildlife sanctuaries were separated because um, of, of palm oil plantations. And we're converting a portion of the palm oil plantation back into a forest so that it creates a pathway to connect these two um, sanctuaries. So how the reforestation happens is that you plant diverse species around the palm trees until they basically take over. Um, so that's a project that we're supporting and it's these kinds of projects that are led by the local community um, and are about reforestation, not tree plantation that we want to support. And rather than having a clear criteria of like, check one box, two box, three box, four box, we engage in conversations with uh, potential partners and decide together whether we're a good fit and whether they um, are transparent enough, whether they're able to provide the data, whether they're able to, um, whether we can trust them or not, um, whether they can, um, supply project updates so that we can inform our users. Uh, those are the kind of things that we're looking at when we consider our partners. Okay. And so what is the ultimate goal you want to reach with uh, Wimori? Yeah, um, that's a really difficult question. Um, I guess the, 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 with Wimori, so right now we're at 2020 and 2030 is, uh, when the SDGs, the 17 goals, are um, set to be met. Um, and for deforestation, or, or regarding the work that we're doing, I think 
one of the goals that I would like to reach is that we're at net forced positive by 2030. And what that means is that we're, um, we, we are growing in forced land uh, than losing in forced land. Um, right now, we are in net forced deficit. So they say we lose about 15 billion trees a year and that we're planting about 6 billion trees. Um, so we're making up for quite a bit of it. But uh, the issue is still that we're losing 15 billion. And the value of one new tree planted and 100-year-old tree is, you know, obviously not the same. So we need to really cut down on losing, and we can also ramp up on reforesting. So hopefully we can bring down deforestation, ramp up reforestation, so that we reach net forest positive by 2030. I think that's a definitely a goal for Wimori. Um, ultimate goal is difficult. Um, uh, I think it's important that. So, so even, so, you know, even if we solve uh, the energy issue, even if we go from coal to renewable energy, we're not really, we're not really addressing the system. Uh, we're, we're not, we haven't solved the ecological crisis. We haven't solved the environmental crisis. Just because we're at net positive, it doesn't mean that we've solved the issue of consumption. Um, it doesn't mean that we have solved the problem of production. So, so it's very difficult to consider, okay, what's the ultimate goal? I think that the ultimate goal, um, or at least the language that I'm using around the ultimate goal is to create a regenerative society. Right now, my belief is that we live in a degenerative society. What I mean by that is for, to reach economic prosperity and uh, societal um, affluence, we are jeopardizing the health and the integrity of natural systems. Um, and that's uh, a contradiction in design because if you think about how we as humans exist, from the air that we breathe to the clothes that we wear, to the food that we eat, to, to, the, to the ginger ale that I'm drinking, to the coffee that I had this morning, we rely and depend in every aspect and element of our life on the environment. So if you think about how our system is operating today, which is that in order to do those things, we are consuming the environment at paces that are unprecedented, and we are slowly eating away at the base upon which everything else depends, you can, you know, you realize that, oh, well, that's not sustainable. So we need to change that. We need to get away from a system where in order for there to be so, so we need to change this current system where for economic prosperity, which is at the very top of the cake, economic prosperity is built on um, society, which is us, which is built on environment. But if we're trying to attain economic prosperity by eating away at the base, which is the environment, then everything topples down ultimately. So that's what we have to change. And how do we do that? is a very difficult question and I think is an open question for everybody to engage in because I don't have the answers. Um, but at least I've been able to identify that we need to transition from this degenerative system to a regenerative system where human societies and economic systems are no longer designed so we are eating away the base. In fact, so that we are replenishing the base. And this connects to what we're doing because we're providing way ways for you as individuals to protect and restore forests and make sure that we're not eating away, that we're adding as much as we can uh, as individuals. Um, so this is trying to reverse the system or provide a tool for people to join in reversing the system. Um, but the system at large still, that the, we more, the success of Wimori does not mean that the system at large has shifted. So, so the question to also ask is, what does it take? Uh, for us to change the system at large and what can we more do to change the system at large and that's a question for us to constantly ponder um, and requires unprecedented levels of collaboration uh, but more than anything unprecedented levels of humility because we have to accept that everything we thought was right was wrong and what does it take for us to have that humility is, is maybe the more difficult question because 
a lot of people like to believe they have the answer whereas we have to accept that all of us were maybe wrong <laughs> i think that's a really really big question and and actually that uh, leads uh, quite well onto my next one because there may be other people uh, in the audience tonight who are thinking about starting a social business or an ngo like do you have any tips for people who want to do that <laughs> No, I have no tips um, <laughs> because um, so we're a nonprofit, which means that we rely on the donations of individuals. Um, we rely on the donations from companies who we agree with. We rely on the support of all sorts of different people. Um, and it hasn't been easy at all. Uh, but one thing that I have been able to do is to not compromise um my ideas uh or how i feel about the current system or how i think about things and you know at one point i had like 400 yen in my bank account but that didn't stop me from pursuing this um so i don't know i don't really have any tips uh i don't really have i i would i could never be the person to write a book about 12 steps to start a <laughs> whatever startup or, you know, I definitely don't think I'm that person, but um, I think it just takes action. <laughs> at the end of the day, it just requires you to stick with your guns and to take one step at a time and to be humble and to um, welcome those people who uh, want to support and help and join you um, because alone you're an island that, you know, you can't really do anything alone. Um, and just, you know, slowly make one step into two steps three steps and then also have more people coming with you on this journey and then just keep expanding and keep adding you know like your uh, capacity um and just 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 keep going just mm. just keep doing because at the end of the day everything is an opinion and everything is a hypothesis and so you all the only thing that i could really do is test my hypothesis and see if it's effective or not i don't know if it's gonna work um but i think <laughs> but i really think it can so yeah um that's that's all i can really say i think that's a good advice like the people like, like gathering people around uh, around you i think that's a good one yeah. Um, actually, we are reaching very soon the end of uh, the chat. Before we, we uh, part ways, I wanted to ask you, you know, do you have any resources that you would recommend to everyone on ecology or forest conservation or deforestation? Okay. Um, yeah, for those of you that are interested, like go out there and uh, search um, and you'll find all sorts of different uh, organizations around the world that do reforestation and um, uh, protection of forests. One of the things that we wanna do as Wimori is to make it simpler to find those places so that we bring the best projects in our opinion to your hands. Um, but if you're somebody who doesn't mind going to the internet and searching all the different organizations, I would say go out there and do that. Uh, it's not difficult to find. Um, yeah, and in terms of resources, uh, if you really found very inspiring anything or documentaries you um, um there you know there's a lot of things but uh recently there was a a documentary by an organization that was that's called nellis next leaders initiative for sustainability um that was published about a month or two ago it's a it's a film made by two brothers in colombia called the hermanos brothers um and it's an extremely artistic film on um, environment uh, and ecology. And the people who are in there speaking about the ideas is, is they're all brilliant. Um, but also the, 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 the artistic value of the film itself is mind blowing. It's, uh, it, we're, it, it's, there's no, well, there's ba barely any footage. It's all archival films. So, it's like a film, it's like a collage film. So it takes all this footage from the past and puts it together and patches it together to weave out a new story on top of the interviews of these really brilliant people who are part of the Nellis um, network. 
and I'm also a part of this Nellis network. Uh, but I would really encourage anybody who is into art, into the intersection of art and environment to check that film out. Maybe I can paste the link uh, later. Um, and for, I don't, I don't really recommend this book per se, but uh, one of the books that really impacted me is uh, The Green New History of the World. And it, it's, it's a really heavy read and a very long read, but any of you who really want to go on to the, you know, jo do that. Uh, <laughs> who, who want to, who really want to read about our interactions with the environment, I would recommend it. It's a, it's a very thick book, about 400, 500 pages by a writer called Clive Ponting. Um, it's called The Green New History of the World. And it is, it is eye-opening. So that's something that I would recommend. Otherwise, uh, if you enjoyed what you uh, heard from me today, please feel free to check out our Kickstarter campaign. Um, we'd be super happy if you could pledge one tree um, that, that plants a tree and also helps us develop our app. And there's also other rewards in there, which we really, really did our best to create. So if you could check that out, that'd be awesome. Otherwise, we're on Facebook and Twitter, or actually on Instagram and Facebook for English and Twitter for Japanese. So feel free to check us out. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Ian, maybe one question that some people might have on um, their mind. Do you have a date for the opening or the launch of the app? When can we expect to be able to, to download it? Yeah, um, so right now we're on Kickstarter raising the funds to develop the app. We're in conversation with uh, many different development organizations, uh, part, uh, companies to see who's our best fit. Um, the fastest we could have it would be at the end of September. Okay. Um, if later, it could possibly be like October or November, but we doubt it. I think we'll be able to have it by September. Um, we're also considering everybody who backs our campaign to become the beta testers. So that could make it even earlier. That could make it like towards the beginning or middle of September. Mm. Um, so if you really want to try it out early, um, yeah, pledge a tree, become a backer. Um, otherwise, yeah, it should hit global um, Apple, I mean, sorry, uh, app stores uh, around, yeah, October, yeah, latest. Awesome. October, November latest, yeah. Cool. So everybody should just follow your SNS to keep updated so they know when they can, they can download it. Please Thanks. do. It. Good to know. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ian, for your time. That was super interesting. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you again so much, Ian, for joining us. And thank you so much. Yeah, we're all rooting for you. And ha, no pun intended. <laughs> we're all rooting for you. And, and we look forward to seeing the launch of the app. Yeah, me as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Good evening. Thank Bye. you. Take care.